On February 16th, 1995, mm -hmm. Jordan was born. Jordan Russell. And why did you name him Jordan? Jordan used to say, oh, you name me after Michael Jordan. And, you know, and I would laugh about that, but that wasn't it. No. I mean, we had decided that if we had a girl, he would choose the name. If we had a boy, I would choose the name. And I never told you because I already knew we had a boy anyway. So I knew I was going to get to choose stack the deck, name. Stack deck, stack deck. I knew is. I was going to get to choose the name. But anyway, um, okay. I chose Jordan because... For me, it symbolized the crossing over of the Jordan River in, in the Bible. I wanted to name him something that would symbolize a crossing over and a new beginning. Fire rescue card or the address of your emergency. Um, I'm at the gate gas station at uh, Bay Meadows in Southside. I don't know the exact address. Okay, what's wrong there? We had shots fired in the parking lot. The person firing has left, but we did get a license number. Someone got shot. Did you see the agenda? No, I didn't. Two black males stepped out. Came from the red SUV. Uh, I don't know if they were trying to stash something in the car or look, look for something or what. It, there was a person here inside the store attempting to make a purchase. The person in the, uh, that was driving the vehicle was the one shooting out of the vehicle at somebody else, but we don't know what happened. How many shots do you think it was? <laughs> yeah, it was more than six. They, 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 it was like pop, 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 and then it stopped for a second, and you heard pop, 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 pop. I mean, I don't know um, if it's true or not, but on TV they always talk about motive. Mm -hmm. Like, you gotta have motive or you gotta show motive. It's like, what's my fucking motive? Exactly. I have saved the jury, will see what happened. And so, so, so understand. Please help us as we are going through the trial today of Jordan Davis. Please comfort his mother's heart, his attorney's heart, his friends and his supporters' hearts. Please heal me. I need your blessings. In Christ's name, amen. here to commence the trial of the state of Florida versus Michael David Dunn. Um, is the state ready to proceed? Yes, sir. The defense ready to proceed? So ready. All right. You were selected as the jury to try the case of the state of Florida versus Michael David Dunn. The first count was first degree murder. There are three counts of attempted first degree murder. And the fifth count is shooting into an occupied dwelling. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence or lack of evidence and on the law that I will instruct you on at the close of the case. So with that said, we're ready to begin with the opening statements. We'll hear first from Mr. Guy on behalf of the state. Mr. Guy. Thank you, Your Honor. May I place the court? Yes, sir. 
The date was November 23rd, 2012, the day after Thanksgiving. Everybody knows that now it's Black Friday. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case is going to take you back when those gunshots ring out. And you'll hear from each of the three boys who call. And they'll tell you that Jordan Davis was upset, no doubt. He was cussing, no doubt. He raised his voice. But he never threatened the defendant. He disrespected the defendant. We are confident that after we hear the evidence and all of it, all of it, that you will know beyond any doubt that when that defendant pointed that pistol at the car full of unarmed teenagers and started and continued to pull the trigger, he was guilty of shooting into an occupied vehicle. Guilty of three counts of attempted murder. And guilty of the first degree murder of Jordan Davis. Members of the jury, you can look at something and see two separate things looking at the same picture. And Mr. Guy told you his version. Mr. Guy told you what he believes the evidence is gonna show. What Mr. Guy didn't tell you is that Jordan Davis threatened Michael Dunn with a shotgun barrel sticking out of the window or a lead pipe. Whatever it was, it's a deadly weapon. We're not here to change the laws. We're not here to say anybody deserved to lose their life. But under the law, it's justified. And Michael Dunn had every right under the law to not be a victim, to be judged by 12 rather than carried by six. That's law and that's justified in the great state of Florida. What's going on with your life that? Oh no, my life is great. Life is that's great. What I'm, I'm got a place on the beach. I got a great job. I got a great girl. Mm -hmm. We just got a little puppy. I mean, the way I see this, this was, um, I was, scared for my life mm -hmm. and I um, fought back mm -hmm. and you guys are seeing this as murder do I do I need to get a lawyer I mean it sounds like I'm in deep shit we were here for Thanksgiving and everybody was in a really good mood just relaxing and having a real holiday and I just talked to Jordan Thanksgiving Day. And then the day after, my phone was sitting on top of the dresser. And I just came in and I saw it was Ron. It was about 10.45. And I said, hey, Ron, how you doing? What's up? Happy Thanksgiving. He said, I got something I need to tell you. And I said, where is Jordan? What happened to Jordan? And he didn't want to tell me, and I yelled. I said, what happened to Jordan? So when I get to the hospital, and there was Jordan sleeping, he appeared to be sleeping. And one of his eyes was halfway open, like he could see me. And as I went over to hug him, um, one of the aides said, Are you because it's an investigation, you can't touch the body. And I ignored him. 
And I went on and I hugged my son and I kissed him. And I started talking to him. And I told him it was gonna be all right. Like you were supposed to protect me. Yeah. You were supposed to protect me. <laughs> and I said, I know, I said, but I couldn't. I said, you know, something happened that was so unusual in its nature. There's no way anybody could protect him. What happened, it wasn't like he was in a bad neighborhood. He was five minutes from home. He wasn't late at night at 7.40 in the evening. He was with his good friends, all good boys. Ladies and gentlemen, when lawyers agree that certain facts are true, that's called a stipulation of fact. You must accept the stipulated facts as having been proven. However, the significance of these facts, as with all facts, is for you to decide. In this case, the stipulated fact that you must accept as true is the state of Florida, uh, the defendant and his attorney, have hereby stipulated to the following. The body examined on November the 24th and 25th, 2012 by Dr. Stacy A. Simons bearing the medical examiner's case number of 12-1982 is that of Jordan Davis. Hello? I have a prepaid call from Mike Dunn, an inmate at Duval County Jail. All inmate telephone calls are recorded. Hey, sweetie pie. Hey, honey. Are you awake? Yeah, I'm awake. I'm just uh, not feeling well today. Are you blue? Yeah. I was really blue this morning. I, I finished off a roll of toilet paper blowing my nose. Yeah. Because I was crying. I just hate this so much. This will be behind us before we know it. Mm. So have a good long life together, baby. Miss you so much. I just can't shake the notion that I'm like, you know, I'm the rape girl that they're blaming because I was wearing skimpy clothes. Like I'm the victim that's being blamed. I was attacked and I refused to be the victim and now now I'm being punished for it. I'm not real um optimistic that those boys will tell the truth. I just, uh, I just want to come home. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was thinking of that. It's like, what, what am I, uh, what am I going to do first? I'm going to make love to my woman, and then I'm going to sleep. <laughs> uh, Miss Wolfson, state's next witness, please. Your Honor, state's called Rhonda Rauer. Rhonda Rauer, please. And if you'll raise your right hand, please, the clerk's going to administer the oath to you. Right hand. There you go. Just relax. It's okay. Relax. Do you, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Ms. Rower, do you know someone by the name of Michael Dunn? Y yes, I do. How long have you known Mr. Dunn for? About four years. Ms. Rower, what is your relationship? Mr. Dunn. He's my fiance. Now, Ms. Rauer, I'd like to turn your attention to November 22nd of 2012. Was that Thanksgiving of 2012? Yes. Why were you all up in Jacksonville that night? Um, because we were going to go to his son's wedding the next day. Why did you and the defendant come up to Jacksonville on Thursday night for the Friday wedding? Um, because we have a puppy named Charlie and, um, 
because you usually can't check into hotels until like three or four and with the wedding being at four we didn't think we'd have time to get settled i know you were kind of just rekindling the relationship with your father is that correct yes it was he appeared to be happy to be there for you very happy is that a picture with you and your bride and your father yes it is any reservations or hesitance taking a photo with your ex-husband michael dunn oh no we made sure that he was in the pictures. And at some point, was your mom upset that Michael Dunn was there? No, not at all. She danced with him at the wedding. And did you have anything to drink during the reception? I had a glass of red wine, and then I had about uh, two to three rum and Cokes. And do you know whether or not the defendant had anything to drink? He had uh, rum and Coke as well. Do you know how many drinks he had? He maybe had three or four. Did he do anything to embarrass you because he was a drunk fool, anything like that? No. Nope. And even when he danced with your mom, stepping on her feet, falling over and no. anything like that? <laughs> no. Did he leave upset because of the type of music you were playing or anything like that? No. Did he ever storm up out of the room or anything like that or show any type of anger about the music that was played? No. Okay. Or tell the DJ to turn it down? No. Continue on I-95 North for one and a half miles. And why was it that you were leaving the wedding or the reception early? Um, because we wanted to get back to Charlie. He was, he's not used to being left alone that long. In a quarter mile, your destination will be on the right. Once you left the wedding, where did you all go? <sighs> to the gate gas station. still have this gate gas station here at the very busy intersection of Southside Boulevard and Bay Meadows blocked off as they look for the shooter here. The confrontation began over loud music and ended with one person dead. They say the suspect fired multiple shots at the victim who was also in the car with other juveniles. The police are searching for this suspect and the only thing they know right now is that he is a white male. Investigators say there is no surveillance video making eyewitness testimony all the more important. I've covered other big trials George Zimmerman to be one of those, but I've never covered a trial with this much national and international attention. Everybody's talking about stand your ground. Everybody's talking about self-defense. What is justifiable use of force? We have a lot of shootings here. People have branded us as the murder capital, uh, but not there. Southside in Bay Meadows where Jordan was killed. Not a place that you would think there's a lot of crime. So a lot of people say, well, that could have been me. It could have been my kids. It could have been anybody. And because of these self-defense laws, was a perceived fear or threat or danger enough to justify somebody shooting and killing them? When the police said that these guys didn't have a record, I was like, yeah, I wonder if they're just flying under the radar. Right. Because they were bad. I mean, yeah. uh, on YouTube videos of these guys, and they're all gangster rappers. I remember the first day I met him, and he introduced me. He's like, Kevin, this is Jordan. Jordan, this is Kevin. He's like, for a big boy, I swear you smooth. That was the first day I met him. I, usually when somebody called me big, I'd be like, dang, that's kind of green. But he made me happy. I was just like, oh, thank you, bro. People portray us as gang members and bad kids. If they hung out with us today, they would have known who the real people were. We lived in the suburbs. <laughs> the struggle is not about, you know, it's eight of y'all in one bedroom house, your mom's a crackhead, your dad left you when you was two years old. That's, that's beyond struggle. We're talking about the everyday struggle, you know? What teenagers go through, no gas money, so you can't get picked up. No money, up. period, as a teenager is just awful. Facebook, Instagram dry, so you can't talk to no females. Yeah. That's the struggle. <laughs> Think about 
He used to dress nice. Man, so I mean, so buy right. the best basketball best shoes, shoes, elite socks. Have a snapback to match Oh, my. Images. You He'll come on the court. I'll be like, man, he look amazing. He looks like he's going to dunk on everybody. And then he gets the ball and he'd start dribbling. I was like, okay, maybe he's just joking around. And then he shoots the ball. He's the worst player <laughs> that you ever will see. Like, ever. But they never stopped him from wanting to play. What would we be doing if he was here today? We probably wouldn't be doing anything. We probably would be sitting at the basketball court just talking. But that's just, you know, that's how we got by. So it's just, it's just, it's just hard. Good afternoon, sir. If you'd please tell the members of the jury your name. My name is Leland Brunson. Where did you meet Jordan Davis? At school. And in the fall of 2012, uh, how often would you see or talk to Jordan Davis? Almost every day. Do you also know a young man named Tevin Thompson? Yes. And how was it that you came to have contact with Jordan Davis on November 23rd, 2012? Me and Tommy picked him and Leland up, sir. And how were the four of you traveling that afternoon? Uh, am I red Dodge Durango? And who was driving? I was. Where did the four of you go first when you and Tommy picked up Leland Brunson and Jordan Davis? Uh, my house, sir. And why did you go to your house? Uh, to change. And why did you want to change? Uh, we was, uh, wanted to go pick up some girls. Okay. <laughs> Where did you go after you changed? Town center. Did Jordan Davis see anyone that he knew at the town center? Yes, sir. Who was that? Aaliyah. What relation, if any, is Aaliyah to Jordan? Uh, boyfriend and girlfriend. When I first met him, I was kind of nervous to talk to him because he was cute. <laughs> but, like, we just hit it off, like, immediately. When I seen him that night, he just came to me and gave me a hug. And then I was like, oh, you know, come shop. Like, you know, I wanted him to stay in the store longer. I was like, just shop, you know. He was like, no, I'm not going to shop. He was with his friends. So I was like, OK, well, I'll call you, like, tonight. We could talk more. That was. Black Friday, and since I work at the mall, I was working all night. And I woke up the next morning, my phone was just like ringing off the hook. Jordan got shot, Jordan got shot. And I'm like, no, he didn't. Like, I just seen him like last night. No, he didn't. And she was like, yeah, he did. Like, I'm like, okay, well, let me try calling, like calling his phone. So I called and I called and it was no answer. When Jordan Davis came into the store, what was his demeanor like? Uh, he was in good spirits. He was happy. Did you know he was coming into the store? <sighs> no, ma'am. Was it a surprise? Yes. Ms. Harris, did you get to talk to Jordan Davis when he came into the store? Yes, ma'am, briefly. Did you all have any sort of fight or argument at that point in time? No, ma'am. And how long did you get to speak with him for? A couple of minutes. When he left, were you all on good terms? Yes, ma'am. What time did he leave the store? Um, I'm not sure exactly what time, but I know it was dark outside. And after he left the store, Ms. Harris, did you ever speak with Jordan Davis again? No, ma'am. Now, Ms. Harris, I believe if you look on your screen, I'm showing you what's previously been stipulated and entered into evidence of States Exhibit 24. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Harris, is that a photograph of Jordan Davis? Yes, ma'am. This busy shopping day is coming to an end. It's the start of the holiday season and a day that retailers say can make or break their year. Shopping on Black Friday takes bravery, preparation, and knowledge. We're going to find that some of the parking lots look a little bit empty, but shoppers were here and they certainly made their mark much earlier today. Did the four of you leave the town center together? Yes, sir. And where were the four of you going when you left? Gate gas station. And why did you stop at the gate? Uh, for gum and uh, Tommy wanted cigarettes. Was there any reason y'all wanted to get gum? No, we didn't want our breath to be stinking. <laughs> okay. What was the reason for stopping at the gas station? <sighs> to get a bottle of wine. 
And whose idea was it, Ms. Rauer? Mine. Were any of the windows in the Dodge Durango down when you pulled um, into the gate station? Yes, sir. And whose window was that? It was Jordan's. Was there music playing in the car while the three of you were waiting for Tommy Storms? Yes. And what type of music was playing? Rap. What was the volume of the music? It was pretty loud. When you pulled up, was there an open spot to the right of the red Dodge Durango? Yes, ma'am, it was. Tell these jurors why you didn't pull into that empty spot next to the sidewalk. I heard the loud music. Didn't want to deal with it. At some point while the three of you are waiting for Tommy Storms to come back, did a car pull into the parking space on the passenger side of the Dodge Durango? Yes, sir. And is that the side that you were sitting on? Yes, sir. Did the defendant say anything about the music when he parked the car next to the red car? Yes. And what did the defendant say? Oh, I hate that thug music. And what was your response to the defendant? I said, yes, I know. What happened, Ms. Rauer, after the defendant parked the car? Um, I gave him a kiss, I took $20, and I went into the store. What did you do while you were in the gate gas station? Uh, I went to use the bathroom, and I bought the cigarettes and gum. Were you aware of anything going on in the parking lot? No, ma'am. You can still hear the music. That was, that was it. Okay. And when you approached the clerk, did you say something to the clerk about that music? Yes, ma'am, I did. Tell the jurors what you said. I asked her, I said, I wish they'd turn that up. It's my favorite song. Ms. Rara, where did you go once you got into the store? I went over to the aisle. Did they have wine? Mr. Thompson, while the three of you were waiting for Tommy Storms, did the defendant say anything to you or in your direction? Yes, sir. And what was that? He said, can you turn the music down? I can't hear myself think. And what did you do when he said, turn the music down? I turned the music down. When you turned the music down, did either Leland Brunson or Jordan Davis say anything to you? Yes, sir. Who spoke? Jordan. And what did Jordan Davis say? Uh, turn the music back up. Did he curse when he said that? Yes, sir. Even if it's Kurt's words, Mr. Thompson, you can repeat what Jordan Davis said. Uh, fuck that. Turn the music back up. And what did you do when you got back to the Durango? I opened the door. I danced a little bit to the song that was playing. I got in the car. Did you see or hear the driver say anything to Jordan Davis after Tommy Storms got back in the Durango? Yes. What was that? Are you talking to me? And how could you hear that? Tevin turned the music down. When? When Tommy got back in to let him know what happened. Did Jordan Davis say anything back to the driver when the driver said, are you talking to me? Yes. What did he say? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Please tell the jurors what happened next. I heard someone yell or someone say something very loud. And what did you hear that person say? No, you're not going to talk to me that way. What did you see the driver of the other car do when Jordan Davis said, yeah, I'm talking to you. He reached into his glove department. And I saw a pistol in the front seat between the steering wheel glove compartment area. It was a big silver chrome, either a nine millimeter or a 45. It was a large caliber. You recognize that? Yes, sir. Does that appear to be the gun that you saw in the defendant's hand? Yes, sir. And what did the driver do with the gun when he grabbed it from the glove compartment? He was holding it and cocked it back. Pulled the slide back, like? Yes. As you were walking to the register, did you hear anything unusual? Yes. What did you hear? I heard pop, pop, pop. And when you heard those noises, did you know what they were? No, I didn't. Did you know where they were coming from? No, I didn't.
What did Tommy Storns do when the driver of the other car started firing into Jordan Davis's door? He put it in reverse and backed did, up. Did he back up? Yes. Was the defendant still firing when Tommy Storns was backing away? Yes, sir. Did you hear any gunshots strike the car? Uh, I remember hearing glass shatter. And how did you feel when you were uh, driving away, being shot at, and you heard the glass shatter? I mean, I was in a panic and just scared. And what happened to Jordan Davis? He stayed sitting up? No, I tried to pull him down. But when I pulled him down, he just fell into my lap. I called his name, but he didn't respond. So I checked his body to see if he was hit. How did you check his body? I just pat him down in and his upper body. Did you um, touch anything that led you to believe he had been shot? Yes. What? When I reached, when I reached and touched him, blood appeared on my fingers. Lucy tried to have a child. Uh, she had a few miscarriages, and uh, we were, you know, really distraught about that. We thought we'll never have a child together. Like a miracle, you know? It was like, she's pregnant, and she just couldn't believe that. Oh, her stomach was growing. I saw it growing. Had the C-section. I was right there with the doctor, had my big face right there. And as soon as they brought him out, I was the first face that he saw. Tell you what, it looks just like daddy. Yeah? Me and Lucy split up in 1998, and Jordan was three years old. And then later on, when I moved back to Jacksonville, Florida, Jordan was living in Georgia, and I made sure that every two weeks would come and fly to Florida. I made sure that I was going to be in my son's life. We made it work. We made it work. Wake up in the morning, I'm always listening for Jordan for whether he's up or not. And uh, I still have it in my mind that he may be downstairs until I realize after a couple of seconds, mere seconds, that he's not going to be downstairs and that I am in the situation that I'm at a trial for the killer of my son. And he, Sometimes you sit there and you're thinking, you're thinking, and five and six, seven, maybe sometimes ten minutes will go by, and you find yourself just staring at the ceiling in the morning. And then something just wills you to get up, say, you know what, you got to make another day. Just get up, put your feet on the floor, stand up, and just make another day, because you got to go on.
It's a nice day to be in here since it's so nasty outside. Hopefully you're well rested and ready to get in a full day's work. So just kind of walk me through, you know, just tell me from your point of view what happened at that point. The guy that was in the back is getting really agitated. You know, there's a lot of fuck him and fuck that and um, fuck that bitch. And then the music comes back on. And I don't know if they're singing or what, but they're saying, kill him. So I put my window down again and I said, excuse me, are you, are you talking about me? You know, I'm, I'm still not reacting, but then this guy like goes down on the ground and comes up with something. I thought it was a shotgun. And he goes, you're dead, bitch. And he opens his door. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm shitting bricks. But that's when I reached in my glove box, mm -hmm. unholstered my pistol, and I, I shot. I'll be the first to tell you there's no weapons in that car. I don't know what you saw. That's the Possible when they drove off, they dumped it? They never left the parking lot. Yeah, they drove out, circled right back around, and came right back to that spot. Oh, okay, because... If there was a shotgun, a BB gun, any type of gun at the scene, Hell, if it was a water gun that was black, they looked well, real at the scene. Like I said, it was a barrel. Could have been just a stick, but, I mean, it was... Could it have been your imagination? It, it certainly... Well, no. I mean, anything's possible, I guess, but... The, the... Him coming out of his car was not my imagination. It is day two of the trial of a Florida man accused of killing a teenager over loud music. Michael Dunn is claiming self-defense. Floridians and the country became very familiar with Florida's standard ground law with the George Zimmerman Trayvon right. Martin case. Dunn claims he shot in self-defense because he thought the teenager had a gun. I feel sick in my stomach. I feel sick in my stomach because they're going to argue that he did have a reasonable belief that his life was in danger. He had a reasonable belief because maybe they didn't have a gun, but he thought they had a gun. What do you say? There's a possibility you can get away with, you know, pulling a trigger, shooting someone, and saying, oops, I'm sorry. It doesn't have to be a real threat. It has to be a perceived threat. The self-defense laws were a lot easier for prosecutors when there was a duty to retreat. The change to no duty to retreat and to be able to stand your ground and meet force with force has truly muddied the waters quite a bit. This is not about politicking. This is not about inflaming racial tensions. This is about the right of everyone to protect themselves, to protect their family. From day one, talking to the Dunn family, meeting with Michael Dunn, we knew this was a clear-cut case of self-defense. I could see that the police and the detectives did not investigate what they should have investigated. And to be honest, I think they thought this was just another Typical shooting in Jacksonville, Florida. No offense to you guys in Jacksonville, but you have the dubious distinction of the murder capital of Florida, and I don't think the resource went into the investigation, and I don't think they ever imagined that it was gonna come to this. We have the 911 call where the witness says they were trying to stash something from that vehicle. Not only did they have ample time to get rid of a weapon, they used that time to get rid of that weapon. But had the police done a thorough investigation, we would have never been in a courtroom. And to say the police overlooked or had a chance to do a better job is literally the theme of the trial. Detective Musser, did you ever go into the other plaza where the red SUV had left after the shooting? No, I did not. Did you ever have any of your evidence technicians go to the plaza to investigate the plaza where the red SUV had left that night? No, I did not. Any other officers go investigate that plaza that night where the red SUV left? Not that I'm aware of. Did you call any canine officers to come down to do an article search for weapons at the gate gas station that night? No, I did not. At the plaza? I did not. At the surrounding areas behind where the dumpsters are? No, sir. Uh, well, tell me when they were searched. Do me a favor, look in your report and tell me where that is. On Tuesday, November 27th at 1805 hours. All right, so you're saying those dumpsters were searched four days after the shooting? Correct. Technician Kippel, tell me what weapons were in that car before you got to the scene. 
I'm not, you're asking me to tell you what was in a vehicle before I was even there? It's impossible, isn't it? Uh, I wasn't there yet, sir. Right. My answer to the question is yes, it's impossible. True. So if a weapon was in that car and it was gotten rid of, you could search it all day long and never find one, correct? Yes. If somebody takes a weapon and throws it into a bush and you don't look in that bush, you're never going to find it, are you? True. If somebody goes into a parking lot and throws a gun or a weapon under a car and you don't search that area, you're never going to find it, are you? No. Dr. Simon, if a medical doctor is given bad information, could they make bad decisions as a doctor? If you're asking in respect to whether he could have been standing up as opposed to being seated in the vehicle? Well, that's what I'm saying. So let's say I'm behind a door and it mm -hmm. goes through a door. I've got a door. Let's mm -hmm. say you're there. Mm -hmm. You with me? Let's assume I have a door open right here mm -hmm. between us. Mm -hmm. And now I'm jumping into the back seat. Is it going to go through the door, ma'am? Okay, so if you think about the angle at which a door would be open, and then you think about the angle that the thigh needs to be at, mm -hmm. I would venture to guess that the position that you're in is not going to allow the bullet to go through the door and then turn back around and hit your thigh going this way. So from what you're showing me, I don't see that a path through an open door could have led to, to a path into the body. I, I don't see it. And in the medical field or in anything, have you ever heard of a terminology of garbage in is garbage out? Uh, yes, I have heard that phrase. And for the jury, if you're getting bad facts in, you're going to give bad facts out. It's almost like a mathematical equation. Would you agree? I think that's true for anything where people pass information. And that would even include your own testimony. But like I said, Mary, they were very engaged. And keep in mind, this was a very long day. Strola is trying to say that Jordan Davis tried to get out of the car. Well, it was a lot of rapid line of questioning, and the jurors were trying to keep up, and you could see them looking back and forth when uh, defense attorney Corey Strola would fire off those questions to some of these lead investigators. It's all an effort from the defense to try to create reasonable doubt. What you're going to see is he's going to tie back the issue of Michael Dunn saying that he saw a gun being available to him and that being substantiated by the police work that even some of the lead investigators admitted wasn't uh, ideal. Now the jurors and everyone do have tomorrow off. The jurors are allowed to meet with some of their family members as long as they do not talk about the case at all and it will begin Monday morning I, I don't know why everything worked out the way it did, but it, it was like meant to be. There was a purpose and a reason for it, and, and it, it, it's not for me to spend the rest of my life in prison. It's, that can't be what it is. No, what it, is. it cannot. You are a spirit that is just, if not meant to be caged. Yeah. You are a man of the water. You are a man of life. You are just not to be. Right.
All 12 jurors do not concur. Michael Dunn walks free of being guilty for Jordan. We have to start this all over again, trying the case from the beginning all over again. I don't want to go through this again. Closure for Jordan. I think about what happened in the Trayvon Martin case. Jordan Davis's character is going to be brought into question from the defense, and you will see the same character assassination that went on with Trayvon Martin go on with Jordan Davis. We caught up earlier today with Mark O'Mara, who represented George Zimmerman in his trial. There are a couple of few similarities. Obviously, we have a white man, an adult, shooting uh, and killing a black 17-year-old. Well, me and Jordan had talked about the Trayvon Martin case. I, I remember Jordan put a hoodie on. He has a brown hoodie. I, he said, we kind of look alike, I, I Dad. The biggest difference is that... There are witnesses here. In that case, you had the word of George Zimmerman versus a dead kid, and the dead kid can't talk. Uh, Trayvon Martin's father texts me a couple of days after it happened. I just want to welcome you to a club that none of us want to be in. All of us could have been gone, you know. It's kind of scary. You know, it makes you realize life is short. And we was we was all young. When I walked in there, seeing Jordan's family, I just walked straight. I tried not to look at anybody. I just tried to like stay focused, like. Yeah, I already had like too many thoughts going through my mind, like what if and everything like that. So that's the first time I've seen him since the incident. Um, I felt more angry than scared. But my anger is not going to bring me peace to myself. Now, Mr. Brunson, you were upset that night. Yes. When you found out your best friend died, you were even more upset. That's fair to say. Yes. You're still upset as you sit here today. Yes. You obviously miss your friend, don't you? Yes. You don't want to see your, your friend's memory go in vain, do you? No. And you admit to this jury that he became extremely upset because Mr. Dunn asked him to lower the radio, correct? Yes. And now, isn't it true you told police that night that Jordan said, I'm tired of people telling me what to do. All right. And would you agree that the more Jordan yelled, my client didn't react? Yes. Have you ever seen him act like that before? Yes. At some point, after he was drawing his last breaths, he probably thought about what dad was saying to him. Watch what you say, take care of yourself. Because there are people out here that will do things that they should not do. And, and I could just see him in my heart just apologizing to me knowing that it's going to hurt me to the rest of my days on this earth. That's, that's what pains me. Hi, good morning. I'm Michael Dunn, uh, D-U-N-N. -N. Okay. And how old are you? I'm 47. And how long had you been with Miss Rauer? Three and a half, four years. Did you have a serious relationship with her? Absolutely. She's my fiance. Okay. 
Or were you living with her at the time? Yes, yes, we were. Was this dog kind of your guy's child? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, and what was his name? His name is Charlie. Okay. And there was some testimony about, you heard Miss Rauer say, oh, I hate that thug music. I didn't say this, but if I had said anything, I would have characterized it as rap crap, not thug music. That's not a term I'm familiar with. Hey, hey. Ooh, you such a killer. Body is just a weapon, so lethal. When you're stepping, you're grazing us with your presence. Hold up. Give me a second. Two blocks away from your house. If you let Thug is the new N-word. That's the new way they pursuing us now. N-word is... N word is out and Thug is in. We only knew each other for some minutes. I couldn't tell, baby girl, by the way you kissing. You got a man back home, but he don't seem missing. Um, Mark Dunn, he um, he 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 just seen us. He just seen four black kids, and he heard the music, and he just considered. He just instantly put Thug next to four black kids. But you know, if four white kids was listening to it, you know, what I'm saying, what would you think? They don't call Justin Bieber a thug. He raced in Lamborghinis and all this crazy stuff. He's not a thug. He's just a misled kid. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like thug is just something for for African Americans to be called the N word without being um without being. They don't want to seem wrong for calling us the n-word so they'd be like look at those thugs a uh, rap <laughs> rap crap was saying that uh they made up made it up in his head sat in the jail and just repeated it made it become something in his brain We used to go to the court every day. I'm talking about every, and it's just crazy how he never got better. <laughs> you thought, Could he play defense? Could he play a little defense? I mean, yeah, because he was hyper, and he, was, he could jump, you know what I'm saying? He had the athletic ability, and like, you getting tired, but there's no way Jordan gonna stop. But then when he gets the ball, oh, that's when that's when you can just take it real quick. You can take it right back. Yeah, I used to talk about something, man, you know, you. You gotta practice with the old man before you get out here with with your with your boys, you know. But the old man can give you some pointers, you know. And Jordan, I mean, he should have played football. I think that's that was his best sport. Yeah, I think he, uh, he could have been real good at football. Y'all ever play baseball together? No, nah, we didn't. He was good at baseball. He could play baseball. We man. never really ventured out into mm -hmm. other sports. He was real fast around the bases and all that. Could hit. See, I think that was the problem when it came to basketball. He ran fast. too fast. He got the speed. And the ball wasn't moving. Right, as he was moving, yeah. Mm -hmm. Prior to this, I never heard a gunshot. Barely even seen a gun. All he had to do was basically gun. show us the gun, and I would have been scared just off that. I thought I just got away, you know, clean it. It was a year later near in the trial when I found out my door was literally like shot like that. Thank, you know, thank the Lord that I'm still here. First time you've ever been anything like this in your life. Yes, sir. You were scared. Yes, sir. In your own words, you were terrified. Yes, sir. You didn't call 911. Yes, I did call 911. Not sitting in that plaza when you saw the damage you didn't. Did you guys drive away from the gate gas station? Yes. Did you go to another plaza? No, another plaza was in the same plaza. Now you guys are stopped, correct? Are you saying you didn't open any doors except your own to get out of the vehicle? I don't remember whether I opened any other doors or not. All right, and he never reached into the car to try to stash something, is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Now, are you focused on Tommy and Tevin or are you focused on Jordan? I was focused on Jordan. So things could have happened around that truck that either you don't remember, is that fair? Yes. Things could have happened that you just didn't see, is that fair? Yes. And things were said that you didn't hear. Is that fair? Yes. Now, obviously, Mr. Davis is your best friend and died, and you were shaken up, correct? Yes. You were shaken up for days. Is that fair? Yes. Isn't it true that after this happened, you met with Tevin Thompson and Tommy Storms and talked about what happened several times, didn't you? We did meet up, but we didn't discuss what happened. They're like, 
freaking out because a white guy dared to ask them to turn their... I mean, you know, come on. If you ask me to turn down my music, I'm going to kill you. And if you tell me to mind my own business, I mean, Jesus Christ. When, you know, no wonder people are afraid to tell them to pick up their pants. I don't know, honey. I'm not racist. They're racist. What is with this subculture that feels entitled to exert their will? The only thing I can think of is the culture. I mean, this MTV culture, the gangster right yeah. And where are their dads? Yeah. I don't know what good's going to come out of this, if any good can come out of it, but I'm, I'm thinking that somewhere, somehow, we need to make a public statement about the subculture and we need to recognize well, it. Well, why don't we discuss that at another time? All right. He drove up. She was just getting out the car. That was within seconds of driving up. And what did he say to her? I hate that thug music. music. If I'm white and I don't have any interaction with black people, the only thing I have to draw from is what I see on TV. That's the only thing. And so when I do come in contact with you, my thoughts about you is based on what I've seen on that TV screen. Yeah, you're already judged. You you're, um, you're, you're already judged. People of his ilk. Uh, our condition, and they don't even know their condition. Mr. Thompson, when you met with me about your testimony, did I ever tell you what to say? No, sir. What did I tell you to do? Tell the truth. Are you lying for Jordan Davis? No. Are you lying for Jordan Davis's family? No. Did you take anything out of your car? No, sir. Did, did you take, like, for example, did you take a shotgun? No, and, sir. like, shove it under a car that was in the parking lot? No, sir. Did anybody pick up anything, to your knowledge, from that car and take it out other than the body of Jordan Davis? No. live and studio performance from the talented teens of the Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. First, the fate of accused killer Michael Dunn should soon be in the hands of a Jacksonville jury. Jeff. Can you imagine the hue and cry if an African-American 47-year-old man had pulled up and shot up a car full of four white boys for playing country western music? No, and I don't mean to offend white people, but just about every white person I know automatically fears the black culture and they're already walking around on eggshells. That a lot of black mothers are going to have to have a conversation with their sons that quite frankly they should not be compelled to have. They have to tell their sons to not look a certain way, um, to not wear a hoodie inside the store. People say it's better to be in a good area and live in a classy house, but sometimes it's safer to be in the hood. Mr. Dunn wouldn't come in the hood. Michael Dunn. He was the only one with a gun. We want justice. That's all we want is justice. All my life, I've heard a black guy had a gun. And it's, oops, I'm sorry, it wasn't a gun. It was a comb. It was his wallet. It was a cell phone. It's time to pick up where Dr. King left off. It's time for a movement in this country to be rebuilt. He saw him as a thug because he's lived in this country that caters to white male privilege for so long that out of that lens, he saw him as an other. That the media deliberately went out of their way to strip race out of this, yeah. make it about loud music. Loud music trial begins. Loud music trial continues. Yeah. This wasn't a loud music trial. This was a 21st century lynching. And if somebody says that politics and race aren't going to be played in this, just look outside the front of that courthouse this entire last two weeks. It is, and it's unfortunate. And, and again, I want to be very clear. Nobody from my office or Mr. Dunn has brought race into this. 
period. Matter of fact, I filed a pretrial motion to keep it out. There's case law that says you can't make it about race unless it's charged as a hate crime, which this was not. Michael Dunn was not charged with a hate crime. He's never been racist. He's never been accused of racist. Matter of fact, the guys in the car even testified on cross-examination that that night he never said anything racial. He never said anything. Did you ask the guys in the red SUV to turn down that base? I did. I said, can you turn that down, please? What was the response from the red SUV? They, they turned it off. And at that point, what did you then say? I said, thank you. Very soon after, I start hearing things like F him and F that and... Does it escalate? Well, the music came back on. Now it got ugly. After hearing the something something cracker and this and that, I hear, I should kill that motherfucker. Here, I should fucking kill that motherfucker. And now he's screaming. Okay. There's no, there's no mistake of what he said. That is what he said. Do you then look over to see, is somebody talking to you? I put my window back down and I asked, are you talking about me? Now, what was the response when you said, are you talking about me? Um, he, he reached forward and picked something up and slammed it against the door. I didn't know what it was at first, but when he says, yeah, I'm gonna fucking kill you, I look and I'm looking at a barrel. He's, he's showing me a gun and he's threatening me. What happens now? Well, I didn't react to this. And uh, this uh, young man opened his door, you know, like he cracked it. He just popped it. What did you believe was about to happen to you? I, th I thought I was gonna be killed, but I still didn't go for my gun at that time. I was just like going, oh my God, okay. where is all this hostility coming from? And it was at that point where he said, this shit's going down now. In your wildest dreams, could you fathom being that position over a common courtesy? No. Okay. Now, at this point, what's going through your mind when he said, this shit's going down now? This was a clear and present danger. And I said, um, you're not going to kill me, you son of a bitch. Okay. And as you said that, were you looking at him or were you now moving that, to get that part? Uh, I said that as I was retrieving my pistol. Could you show the jury exactly what you did? Well, if, um, if we say over here is my glove box, um, I'm looking out the window and I said, you're not going to kill me, you son of a bitch. And I shot. Okay. And do you even recall how many times you shot? I do not. Kind of was um, in a fixed position with the tunnel vision. I didn't realize the SUV was moving. I was still aiming at the rear passenger, and it didn't register that the car was backing up. Okay. And at some point, you realize now there's no more red door in front of your face? This is where Rhonda starts coming into my mind, because I know she's heard the shots. I know Rhonda. Um, It, it wasn't just my life I was worried about now. <laughs> and at some point now, do you see that SUV actually drive towards a different direction or try to drive away? It, it did, and th this is where the, um, now they're back in line with if they fire on me, they'll hit the front door, and this is where Rhonda comes out. What was your purpose of firing towards the back of that vehicle? Were you I, I, I was uh, worried about a blind firing situation where they would, you know, shoot over their heads or whatever and uh, hit me or hit me and Rhonda. I stopped firing when um, it appeared that the um, threat was over. Now, Dunn maintains the teens had a shotgun or something that resembled a barrel of something that he thought was a shotgun. And he was also asked why he continued to shoot into the vehicle 10 times altogether. His response to that, he felt they were still a threat, four against one. Once you have somebody threatening you, it's going to happen now. I'm going to kill you, whatever it might be. And then a weapon shows up. It might have been that he was just trying to frighten him. But Michael Dunn doesn't know that. If we don't get a guilty verdict, then as a minority, it's just like another slap in the face.
and constantly telling a race of people that it don't matter. that have had loved ones uh, be victims of violent crimes are following this trial very, very closely. And in a way, they're reliving their own loved ones' cases. First Coast News, Michelle Casada continues... Mike on the West Coast. Side is with us. Thanks for calling the show, Mike. How are you today? My son's case, unsolved, going to be the seventh year. And it's still hard for me. I know they do have who killed Jordan Davis, but still, their father is supposed to be the protector, you know. Nothing could come to harm because your father's there. He's going to have days where he's walking, driving, sitting, and the knot is just going to come in his stomach. This is terribly uh, birthdays, Father's Day, of course, and Christmas. Thanksgiving. When everybody's around, it's easier to go through. But then once it gets quiet, it stays quiet for a long time. How was Rhonda once you explained to her what happened? Or did you explain or try to in the vehicle? I tried to, but she was hysterical. Okay. And were you still shaking and, and panicking. I wasn't much better. You know, I tried to get out the fact that um, they were threatening me. I tried to get out the fact that they were advancing on me. I tried to get out the fact that they were armed. Uh, I was explaining to her that it was self-defense, but it was um, difficult to say the least. Did you have any belief or inclination that you were gonna be accused of murder? Absolutely not. Okay. At some time, though, in the middle of that night, you do learn that somebody had passed away. Yes, I, I used my um, phone. I don't remember exactly what it said, but it was something about um, shooting on South Side. Can you tell the jury how you reacted when you saw that on your phone? I, I, I ran to the bathroom. I just, tell the jury why you ran to the bathroom. I, I vomited. How long were you in that bathroom, sick to your stomach? All the rest of the night. And at 7 o'clock when Miss Rower woke up, what did you hear Miss Rower say to you? I guess the TV was on and she saw the news report. What did Miss Rower say to you? Take me home. How many times did she say that to you? Multiple times. At the time, I was more concerned with getting her taken care of, go deal with law enforcement later. Nothing further on Mr. Guy, cross-examination. Mr. Don, you, you love Rhonda Rauer. Yes, sir, I do. Right? You, you love her a lot, right? Yes, sir, I do. Right, and when she got into that car, she asked you what happened, right? Yes, sir. Sir, are you telling this jury that on the way back to the hotel, you told Rhonda Rauer that the boys in the car had a gun. If I told her on the way to the hotel, I told her um, several times at the hotel, I told her several times on the way home that this was self-defense. That wasn't my question. From the time you left the gate station to the time you got back to the Sheraton, how many times did you use the word gun to describe what the boy, let me finish what the boys in the car had. I couldn't tell you. Was it more than one? At least one. Mr. Dunn, the truth is, you never told the love of your life that those boys had a gun. You weren't there. Did you? You did tell her then? I said you were not there. I, I get that, I know that. Truth is, you never told Rhonda Rauer they had a gun. That is incorrect. State now has an opportunity to present some rebuttal uh, testimony or evidence to you. And so in that regard, uh, the state's next witness is. Your Honor, the state calls Rhonda Rauer. Rhonda Rauer, please. Ms. Rauer, if you'll come up to the front again for me, please. And you were sworn the other day, but I'll have you come in and raise your right hand. The clerk will administer the oath to you again. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? 
All right, ma'am, if you'll come right around here and resume the seat. Remember to speak uh, loudly into the microphone so everybody can hear you, all right? Uh, yes, sir. All right, uh, Ms. Wolfson. When you came out of the gate gas station and you got into the defendant's car? Yes. Did the defendant ever tell you he saw a gun in that red SUV? No. Did the defendant ever tell you that he saw a weapon of any kind in that SUV? No. There was no mention of a stick? No. There was no mention of a shotgun? No. There was no mention of a barrel? No. There was no mention of a lead pipe? No. Back in the hotel room, Ms. Rauer, that same night, did the defendant ever tell you that he saw the boys with a firearm? No. Did he ever tell you that he saw the boys with a weapon? No. On the two hour drive the following morning, did the defendant ever tell you that he saw a gun in the SUV? No. And on that two hour drive, did he ever tell you he saw a weapon of any kind no. in that SUV? No. glad today's over. May she be excused. Yes, Even if we don't get the verdict that we expect that we should get, we should get at least the truth has been exposed. The fact that she stood her ground and told the truth is huge. And I didn't expect that she would do that. She was the key witness that could testify against him, and she did. I don't know if she has any children. I don't know if she's a mother, but I was praying that if she were, that something in her consciousness, something in her heart, something somewhere would kick in and she would be convicted to tell the truth. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome back. Uh, we are ready to begin closing arguments. And is the state ready to proceed? We are, Your Honor. All right. We don't want your sympathy. We don't want a, a lesser included offense. We're not asking for that. We're asking for the truth as you know it now, now, in your heart in your head, in your gut. You know, there's an old saying in the legal community, if the facts are against you, argue the law. If the law's against you, argue the facts. If they're both against you, put somebody else on trial. Isn't that exactly what the defense has done in this case? Thugs. He said in his interview, thugs, you met them. You've met them now. It's your call. Are any of them thugs or gangsters? Jordan Davis didn't have a weapon. He had a big mouth. And that defendant wasn't going to stand for it. This case is not about self-defense. It's about self-denial. He didn't have to shoot him. He decided to shoot him. He chose to shoot him. That's why it's not a self-defense case. That's why it's a murder case, period. I'm gonna leave you with um, one quote. To the living, we owe respect. But to the dead, we owe the truth. 
Jordan Davis, Jordan Russell Davis, 17 forever. You cannot lawfully convict any human being unless every single element of the crime is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Jordan Davis had every chance to get out of that car, like Mr. Dunn said, and he did. And Judge Healy's gonna tell you that Michael Dunn had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force. His honor will further tell you that the danger facing Michael Dunn need not be an actual, that the appearance of danger must have been so real that a person under the same circumstances would have believed that the danger could be avoided only through the use of the force that he used. Michael Dunn must actually believed that the danger was real. That's the standard, that's our law. And whether you like the law or don't like the law, you have to use the law. And that blanket, that flag wraps around this man until the state can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it was not self-defense. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe the defendant is innocent. The presumption stays with the defendant through each stage of the trial unless it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. Michael Dunn is justified in using deadly force if he reasonably believes that such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or another, or the imminent commission of an aggravated assault, aggravated battery, attempted murder, or murder against himself or another. If you have a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty. But I, I want us to find some way that this trial can affect the way we think about stand your ground. I have no problem with self-defense, but stand your ground is self-defense plus something more. Well, I don't want people to have self-defense plus something more. I want to hear from people who've been down there at the trial and for people who have been down there at the demonstration. I don't believe he'll be convicted. I, I just don't trust the system. What happens if Michael Dunn is acquitted? Well, I mean, it's going to be open season. Right? Open you can season say later on, that maybe he did who? have a gun. Open It'll be open season, season on, on black teenagers yes. who, are, who are acting like teenagers have always acted, no matter what race you are. I think they're all just saying there's no justice, no peace. That's going to cause a whole lot of violence coming out of this town. Uh, in other towns, I mean, it's just the way it's going to be. And all these people chanting this crap is going to bring down a whole lot of old crap on folks that don't deserve it. I can't even contemplate being found guilty and being sentenced to prison for life. Uh, it's not possible. You know, I don't have any experience with the criminal court systems, but I cannot see them deliberating for a long time. You know, I, I, I just don't see this being a hard decision to make. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a note from the jury. And it is, if we determine deadly force is justified against one person, is it justified against the others? And the answer is no, not necessarily. Self-defense and justifiable use of deadly force applies separately to each count. So there you go. I'll let you go back to the jury room to resume your deliberations. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and attention again. We are on verdict watch in the Michael Dunn murder trial. It's an intense moment. These jurors have been deliberating at nearly 20 hours. It tells us they're seriously considering that self-defense. The lies credibility to me that he saw a gun, felt his life was threatened, shot at this car what nine times, didn't call the cops, drove off, didn't mention the gun to his girlfriend. You know, at some point these things just don't add up. You just have to try to come up with excuses of how much fear you were in. That's the problem with this stand your ground law. It's only your word against a dead man's word. 
change your ground law. It has nothing to do with race. Today it benefits everyone equally. We but there's a perception that it benefits white shooters more than African American. That's the perception many black folks have. All different demographic groups are more likely to see a non-existent weapon. It could be a cell phone, a backpack. They think it's a gun when it's in the hands of a young African American. This defendant could very well have seen a, a completely non-existent weapon. I don't see how all these people can come back. Uh, with a consensus, unanimous decision. They're fighting over whether it's justifiable or not. All right. Three, four, three, four, three, four, three, four. And the note reads as follows. We have reached a verdict on four of the five counts. We are unable to reach a unanimous verdict on count one or any of the lesser included offenses. If we are unable to agree and reach a verdict, is the entire case mistried or is the single count mistried? My answer to them would be, if you are unable to agree on a verdict as to that count, only that count is mistried. The other verdicts stand. Right now, they do have the verdicts on the other four counts, but that will not be disclosed until they finish and they're trying to reach because they're deadlocked on charge number one. Of course, the first degree murder charges are probably the most important here, and that is why so many people are out here because they say they want justice for Jordan Davis. What can be done in Jacksonville to minimize the likelihood that there will be another shooting just like the Michael Dunn shooting of Jordan Davis? Are we ever going to achieve racial justice or are we going to act like a town that's only one generation removed from the KKK? You know, I, I think no one's really asking uh, the bigger question and that's what is wrong with people in this country thinking that it's okay whether they're defending themselves or not, to kill someone. Emily, Father, I know that you're in that room with the jurors. I pray that your truth is what they see. You already know the outcome. And I believe that it'll be just. But Lord, I'm so human, because I doubt. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, again. I understand that we now have a verdict, apparently, as to all counts. But I've never seen a case where deliberations have gone on uh, for this length of time, and we must respect uh, the jury's verdict. This is a very, very emotional time. I understand that. I would ask you to continue to abide by my rules of decorum and ask you to please uh, Refrain from any emotional outbursts once you hear the verdict read. This case is not about winning or losing. I have the verdict form in count one. There are no markings on it, but I will provide it to the clerk for the record. And based on the jury's inability to reach a verdict as to count one, I will declare that mistried. The other verdict forms are in order. I'll give them to the clerk for publishing. Verdict is to count two. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of attempted second degree murder, a lesser included offense. Verdict is to count three. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of attempted second degree murder, a lesser included offense. Verdict is to count four. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of attempted second degree murder, a lesser included offense. We find that the defendant discharged a firearm during the commission of the offense. The jury in the so-called loud music trial could not reach a verdict on the most serious charge, first-degree murder. A mistrial was declared on that count of first degree for killing 
Jordan Davis. I would love to hear from the jurors how they justify convictions of attempted murder, but not murder. We didn't have justice for Jordan. Was he all right to kill my son? I think it's appalling that the stand your ground is in the self-defense. What did the defendant think at the time? And did he reasonably think that he was going to be harmed? That's very confusing. How could they determine as a jury whether, what somebody else is thinking? We expect the law to be behind us and protect us. And that's what I wanted the law to do, is protect Jordan as we protected Jordan. We're so very happy to have just a little bit of closure. And we will continue to stand. And we will continue to wait for justice for Jordan. justice system let Michael Dunn escape criminal liability for killing Jordan Davis just as George Zimmerman escaped for killing Trayvon Martin. something perversely wrong when a nation callously condones killing innocent people and they think that it's their right just because they've been empowered by a gun and it really has nothing to do with your second amendment rights it has to do with being human today's hearing is entitled stand your ground laws civil rights and public safety implication of the expanded use of deadly force. In some devastating cases, the laws have emboldened those who carry guns to initiate confrontations which have ended up killing unarmed children. Self-defense is a bedrock liberty of every American. I was raised in a family steeped in justice and confident in the triumphant goodness of humanity. My father worked actively with President Lyndon Baines Johnson in the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If he could see me here today testifying in front of the United States Senate, he would be beaming with pride and amazed at how far his daughter had come until he came to understand what brought me here. I appear before you because my son Jordan was shot and killed while sitting in the back seat of a friend's car listening to loud music. The man who killed him opened fire on four unarmed teenagers, even as they tried to move out of harm's way. Seven months after a mistrial was declared, Michael Dunn is being tried again for the murder of Jordan Davis. 
And it has been a very long two years for two people in particular. Yeah, and we're talking about Jordan Davis's parents here, Ron Davis and Lucy McBath. They have been here at the Duval County Courthouse every single day for every single minute of these proceedings. They tell me that they are cautiously optimistic that this time a new set of jurors will come back with the verdict that they have been waiting for, and that of Kurt, of course, is first degree murder for Michael Dunn. All right, uh, Madam Clerk, can you publish the verdict, please? The State of Florida versus Michael David Dunn. Verdict, we the jury find the defendant guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. Mr. Dunn, you having been found guilty of premeditated murder in the first degree of Jordan Davis, which carries a minimum mandatory life sentence without parole, I hereby sentence you to serve that minimum mandatory life sentence without parole. We thank you, God, for a job well done, Lord God. God, we pray you that Mr. Dunn, this tragedy could have and should have been avoided. You hear people talk about and debate the right to stand your ground, and there is such a huge misunderstanding among the general public about that term. Self-defense, justifiable homicide, and excusable homicide are very complicated legal doctrines and laws. While that debate will, I'm sure, continue, we should remember there's nothing wrong with retreating or de-escalating a situation. To lose a child is a parent's worst nightmare. And Mr. Dunn, your life is effectively over. It's absurd, everything is absurd. It's like, I'm the fucking victim here. It's 100% on uh, Jordan, 100%. I, I don't even take a half a percent. I mean, he, he, he made that happen. But, you know, maybe, maybe he would have killed somebody if it hadn't been me.
Oh no.